a few verses from this chapter this morning. Begin reading at verse 1, if you will. We're going to continue our theme about reaching out to our neighbors uh, again today and then again next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zoar, the son of Bechora, the son of Aphibia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And it is a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. For his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, and go seek the asses. And he passed through the Mount Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shashiah, uh, but they found them not, and they passed through the land of Shalim, and there, uh, there there were not. And they passed through the land of the Benjaminites, but they found them not. And when they were come uh, to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father leave, caring for the asses, and th take thought for us. And he said to them, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he's an honorable man. And all that he saith surely come to pass. Now let us go thither. Preadventure he can show us our way uh, that we should go. How will our neighbors remember us? That's my question. How will our neighbors remember us today? Here, one thing we can learn from this passage of Scripture, uh, that Paul, or Saul rather, was a distinguished young man when the Lord called him. The Bible said that he was a handsome man. Uh, he was about a head, uh, sh uh, head and shoulders taller uh, than anybody else there within that region. Uh, he was an amazing man. This is an amazing description of a man uh, that's going to be a leader uh, in the, as a king in the nation of Israel. Even though outward beauty is something to behold, and we really strive for it today, if you think about the cosmetic business, the plastic surgery business, and all the things that uh, people do and buy and invest their monies in just to make this part of their body that much more prettier and other parts as well, we know we put a lot of emphasis on the outward appearance that we have. And I suppose that is all good, fine, and dandy. But I think that God is more concerned about what goes on inside of us than what we look like on the outside. However, that being said, Saul was obedient to his father uh, in that Saul went out and looked for the donkeys uh, that had run away from the father's house. She said, well, that's not a big deal. Let me tell you, obedience to God is always a big deal. Together with his servant, they went from place to place, uh, from town to town to no avail. They were not able to find the donkey. In spite of the efforts, they were empty-handed every time they went. But the missing donkeys, I don't think, was the crux of the matter. I personally believe that Saul was going through a type of a test from God in order to see what was in his heart. Could Saul be obedient about small things before he could really be trusted with bigger and grander things. If Saul could have not been concerned about a few donkeys that got lost, uh, how in the world could he ever be concerned about ruling the people of the nation of Israel? If Saul could not be faithful over the minute, uh, silly little things, could he ever be found faithful over the bigger and the more extravagant things of life? In order for God to choose the king of Israel, God looked first at the humble obedience uh, that this man had with in his life. Physical appearance is good. It goes a long way in our society today. Uh, women go haul wild and ape crazy over a dark, tall, handsome man. And they think that's the grandest thing in all of the world today. But I believe the attitude of the heart is the thing that a man needs or a woman needs to have a right standing before uh, the Almighty God. What's going on on the inside? A uh, friend, God uh, can always take a nobody and make a somebody out of him. I've never been tall. I've never been dark, and I've never been handsome. For that matter, if I go out in the sun, I don't get a suntan. I just fry. I mean, I just burn up. I'm red from the top to the bottom. Uh, and I mean, I blister and all that. It's hard on me. But God can take the nobodies and make a somebody out of them if that nobody will be obedient to hear the voice of God and to obey what thus saith the word of the Lord. And that's what I think we need to cultivate. We must concentrate on developing godly character in this hour in which we live. We are to strive uh, 
are to be holy people. We are to strive to live a life of wholeness. Be willing to obey the commands of God, for it's in that we will be set free. In Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, uh, you will eat the good things of the Lamb. There are two things that God requires here, and that is our willingness and our obedience unto the Lord. If we do that, we have the promise from God that we will eat uh, from the plenty of the Lamb uh, that God has before us. Again, obedience and willingness to obey God. Another thing that I read from this scripture that I find out from about Saul, uh, the first king of Israel, that he was willing at least at this chapter of his life uh, to be directed by the Lord. Understand that. He was not willing to take matters into his own hands. He was willing to be directed uh, by the Lord. Uh, Saul was directed to the house of Samuel. Uh, and he said, Behold now, there is in the city a man of God. He's an honorable man. All that he saith shall surely come to pass. Let us go thither, preadventure. He can show us uh, our way that we should go. He was willing, Saul was, to uh, listen to the guidance of the Lord. Here we find that a loss at what to do. They went here, they went there, but Saul was lost as to where to go to find the donkeys that had been lost. He didn't what to do. Uh, Saul was an influential man. He was a handsome man. Uh, he was a powerful man. Uh, he had servants about him. Uh, he also could have probably called for the armies so and they would have come to help him, but he did not know what to do. There'll come a time in every one of our lives, no matter how much education we have, how secure we are, how much money we have, how influential we think we are, there'll come a time in our life we simply will not know what to do. And we need something beyond our own self, beyond our own source, beyond our own resource, and beyond our own recourse uh, to know what to do. And that comes through seeking uh, the face of the living God. I remind you, uh, he was an important man, but he was at a loss as to know what to do. But he said, there there is a man of God in the city. Maybe he can tell us what to do. Now with that being said, let's get on the wings of our imagination this morning and let's fly five years out into the future. And say there is someone in your neighborhood, someone that you work with, someone that you go to school with, somebody that you know very, very well, and you've rubbed elbows for a long, long time uh, with that individual. And say that individual is very depressed, very despondent, uh, to the place they're even suicidal. Uh, it may be a government worker. It may be a social worker. Uh, it may be a business person. It may be a school teacher, a truck driver, uh, somebody that flips hamburgers at one of the fast food joints, or a bag boy at one of the supermarkets. But that individual is so depressed that he or she is contemplating uh, taking his or her own life. Uh, take the gun out, uh, cock it, and put it to the temple of the forehead, and all of a sudden they lay it down, and you hear your telephone ring. And on the other end is that despondent individual uh, saying, look, I need some help. I've come to wit's end. I don't know what to do. I'm depressed. I've been given a pink slip at work. Uh, my wife has just left me. Uh, my husband's committed the adultery on me. I have terminal cancer. I don't, well, the list goes on. I just banged her. The list could go on and on. And they say, I simply do not know what to do. And I'm ready to take my life. But I remember you are a man of God. I remember that you are a woman of God. I've watched your life. I've watched you live. I've seen you go through crisis times and you made it. Maybe you can help me in this moment that I'm living right now. Brothers and sisters, our neighbors need to see a true man of God and a true woman of God. God in the neighborhood. Our neighborhoods need to see that. Not religious people. Uh, not people that go to church on Sunday morning. And not people that just have a religion that they use. The world, our neighbors, your neighbor and mine, they're sick and tired of religion. Uh, they're retired of religious hoax. They're retired of religious scandal. And they're tired of hypocrisy. What they need to see today is a true, blue, genuine, blood-bought, born-again, Holy Spirit-filled man of God and woman that live with in their neighborhood. Uh, hurting people need people uh, that has a word for them, that has a helping hand to give them, and they can have a word of wisdom uh, to drop into the heart uh, from time to time today. Hurting people hurt people. But we are not there to add to their hurt, but be able to help them during their time of hurt as well. Notice first of all, behold now, there is a man of God in the city. Notice this, Christians, we are not a byproduct of this world or of this world's system. We are in the world, but the world ought not be in you and it ought not be in me. 
We are not citizens of this earth going to heaven. We are citizens of heaven as we pass through this earth. We march to the sound of a different drum beat. And the drum beat is the heartbeat of God that one day is going to take us into the celestial city where God himself lives and dwells and we shall be there as well. But to a world that's unsaved, they are waiting upon Armageddon and they're waiting upon a judgment that will come from the very God whom they have offended and whom they have sinned against. But being an honest, God-fearing disciple and believer of Jesus Christ the Lord, being a true blue blood walt spirit-filled child of God is the greatest asset that your neighborhood can have. It's the greatest asset that any city can have. It's the greatest asset uh, that any employer can have uh, today. The greatest asset to our city is not the mayor. The greatest asset to our city is not the legislative body. Uh, The greatest asset of our city uh, is not the businessmen. And the greatest asset of our city are not the beautiful buildings that we have, as important as they are. But the greatest asset to any neighborhood, to any community, and to any city is the man and the women of God who can hear the voice of God, obey the voice of God, and live this thing up on the sidewalks uh, where we live today. We'll do more for our city than anybody will ever do uh, by legislation. I remind you today, my brothers and sisters, the individual who changes the city does not do it by legislation. Thank God we do it by prayer. Uh, We don't change the city uh, by sitting on a committee somewhere and allocating millions of dollars uh, to some rehab. I believe we change the city better as we put our boots in the neighborhood, as we put our shoes on the sidewalk, and as we go out telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ and watching them being transformed by the power of the Almighty God this morning. The city will be blessed by the people of God who walk its streets, uh, who pray for its leaders and share the faith boldly uh, with those who need it in the time of need today. Christian, we are an asset, not a liability to the world. We're an asset, not a liability to our neighborhood. We are an asset, not a liability to where you work this morning. The light of the world and the salt to this earth. Now, with that being said, there may be times you may feel all alone as you serve the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Our city is filled with many religions today, but few dedicated Christians. Our city is filled today with many people that attend church on Sunday, but many that fail to live for him Monday through Saturday. Our cities are filled today with people that give the Lord Jesus Christ lip service, but they fail to make him Lord of their life and King of their life and Savior of their souls. Yet not to sound judgmental, not to sound holier than thou, but more times than not, in this hour we live, you may feel all alone in your walk with God in your neighborhood. Elijah felt that way on Mount Carmel. But one thing that set Elijah apart from everybody else was the man knew how to hear the voice of God and how to obey the voice of God. A child of God needs to send out today. As a blood-bought child of God this morning, you and I are supposed to be different in this world. Not different for being different sake, not being odd, not being weird, not being uh, ooey and eerie. We're to be different Not like we just stepped out of the 18th century, dressed up in the 18th century. We're to be different from the world. Different the way we live our lives in a way that will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Different the way that uh, we live holy uh, without being judgmental. Live differently in lives that makes us salt to the earth and the light of the world. Uh, Different in the fact that we are a people uh, that do right when everybody else is doing wrong. Let me tell you something, friend. It will not be you and me and the assemblies of God that will change this world, but it's the God of the assembly working through us that will change this world today. We don't live like church around people. We live like Christians around people. Uh, We don't advertise our church around people. Uh, We're advertising our Savior around the unsaved people today. And they need to see Jesus in you and Jesus in me. Now how can you become that man of God? How can I become that man of God? Simply by loving him and obeying him. It's just that simple. By loving him and by obeying him. You know what's sad? There are many professing Christians in in America today. Honestly, they would not know Jesus Christ if they bumped into him at Walmart this afternoon. Let's be real about that. Got a lot of religious people. But they wouldn't know him if they bumped into him in the parking lot of Walmart. You see, it's not how much knowledge about the Lord we have that's important. It's how much knowledge of the Lord that we have is important. People could care less about your experience in God. 
But your neighbor and my neighbors, they need to see God's experience in me and God's experience in you. Yeah. Too many people go through the motion of knowing God and they want to fake it. But why in the world should we fake it if we can have the real deal? Amen. Friend, know Him, love Him, and obey Him. Now the Bible doesn't say to keep His commandments and love Him. If all we're trying to do is keep a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, all that's going to do is put us in bondage. All that's going to do is give us an old sour disposition. All that's going to do is make us sourpuss Christians. There'll be no joy. There'll be no peace. It's just religious exercises that we do. We can't do this. We can't do that. We don't do that. We don't do this. That's the way I was raised when I first got saved. And, and people say, what, what, what's it mean to be a Christian? Well, I can't do this. And I, can't. I mean, I thought, dear Lord, I was in bondage before I got saved. It's not about keeping rules and regulations. It's about holding a relationship with Jesus Christ and loving Him and obeying Him as He tells us what to do. The world don't need to see my religion. They need to know my relationship I have with the Lord. Religion will turn people away. Our neighbors don't want to see us keeping a bunch of rules and regulations. Our neighbors want to see us living with Jesus, living Jesus, living through us every day of our life. Jesus said, love me and keep my commandments, not the other way around. Friend, we have the ability today to hear so many voices in this world. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get confused as when God's talking to me, when the devil's talking to me, when I'm talking to myself. Let's be real. Anybody? Yeah. We struggle. So there's voices out there. Which one are we going to yield to? Which one are we going to learn to be the voice of God? And which one are we going to follow? There are voices in this room right here, right now. You, can you hear them? I can't. But I guarantee you, if you dial up your cell phone and go to an FM radio station, or you bring a radio in here and plug it up and turn it on, and you scan that dial, you'll hear anything from country, western, to opera, uh, to jazz, to, to the new age, to you name it, it's out there. Radio talk shows, sports cast, you, it's all out there. You just got to tune it in. The voices are there. But we got to have a tuner that hears the voice of God. How many of you ever called somebody, a business, and you're talking on that telephone, and about three minutes later you realize this ain't a person, that's a cotton-picking recording. I mean, you ask it questions, it answers you. And you make matter worse, you ever had them call you? Hello, may I speak to Fred? He's not here. When do you expect him back? I don't know. May I call back later? No. Okay, bye. It's a robocall. I'm told in a conversation with a dumb computer. And yet the same thing, friend, we can do the same thing in Christianity. We're not careful. We can settle for something somebody else's voice, somebody else's influence upon our life. Don't settle for a substitute voice when we can hear and know the true voice of the Almighty God. There are many voices speaking to our hearts, many voices speaking to our mind. But Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice and they will follow me. It's imperative that we know the voice of God. We hear His voice. Let's don't compromise it. Let's don't give a death ear to it. Friends, obey it. Go with it. Now, I want to make a statement. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what people say. I don't care what religious people say. And I dog sure don't care what the devil says. By the grace of the living God, I'm going to obey His voice and let God confirm it. And there'll be times God will ask you to do things that makes no sense to you whatsoever. No sense whatsoever. But if we learn to obey in the small things, there'll be a day he'll trust us with the bigger things in life as well. Let me tell you something. Obey the voice of God. He'll confirm it for his glory and for our good. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. There needs to be a man or woman of God in the city, a man or woman of God in your neighborhood who can hear the voice of God, uh, discern the voice of God, and know the voice of God, and obey the voice of God. Amen. Secondly, there's a man of God in the city, but he's an honorable man. Beloved, in our neighborhood, in our community, in our city, Help give Christianity a good name. Help give the Assemblies of God a good name again. Too many professing Christians have compromised the truth and the integrity of God's Word for just a few minutes of feel good. And as a result, they have been able to compromise the integrity of God's Word. And it's, it's brought a bad blemish upon the church. It in turn has brought dismay uh, to the character, the name of God that's robbed him of his glory. 
I'm going to make a statement. There was a day when sinners of God people looked more like Jesus than they did the world. Uh I'm just dodging the books. There was a day when Pentecostal people looked more like Jesus than we did the world. There may have been excess. We understood what the power and the presence of God was. I remember people standing in line on Sunday night to get saved. And it's hard to get a crowd back on Sunday night, especially today. I remember preaching the word of God and conviction to be so strong. People would run to the altars because they knew they were living in sin, but today they laugh at it. I remember a day when the gifts of the Spirit would operate and people would stand there with goosebumps running up and down their back in fear and trepidation of being on the Holy God, but today people will laugh and laugh and get up and walk out while God is moving. I don't understand it. We've taken the holy things and made them trite. There was a day, don't misunderstand me, I love the assemblies of God. I thank the Lord for our doctrine. I thank the Lord for our core beliefs. I thank God for our preaching and our teaching stance. I thank God for our emphasis on missions and the baptism in the Holy Spirit and our missionary zeal. But friend, all that's null and void if we're not living it. I said all of that is null and void if indeed we're not living it. Now and again, Pentecostal preachers mess up and they fall. But for the grace of God, that could be any one of us. Hear me, we all war against the flesh, the world, and the devil. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But here's the great thing, we can stay in the book. And this book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. We can stay on our knees in prayer to listen to the voice of God, and he will lead us not into temptation. Uh, We can obey the voice of God, it will spare us from a lot of pain and a lot of heartache within this world that we live in today. If you are a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, be honorable before God in all of your living. Be honest in your business dealings. Pay your bills and pay your bills on time and live within your means. Be honest in your money matters and be a good steward with everything God's given you. Pay your tithe and give your offering. You know why? God owns it all. We're just simply stewards of what God has asked of us to do in this world today. Be honest with your family. Be faithful to your spouse. Love your children. Love your grandchildren. And don't be afraid to parent them. They don't need you to be their friend. They need you to be their parent. Watch what, they're watching. watch what they're watching on TV. Watch what they're watching in the movie house. Know who their friends are. Know what they're doing on the computer. They need a parent today. Be honest with your employer. Uh, if indeed they pay you to work eight hours a day, let it be the greatest eight hours that you put and give to them uh, because you're bringing glory to the Lord by the way you're working. Going to church now and again is not enough. The way we behave It tells what we really believe. We can say we believe one thing, but if we behave differently, our life has just been hypocritical to what we say. You've heard me say it before, we teach some of what we do, more of what we say, but we teach the most by what we are. You cannot separate your belief from your behavior. Are you with me? Boy, it's quiet in here this morning. Good time to sow some seed, I guess. I remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus, up in the mountains of Virginia. I worked in a mining machinery factory. And back in those days, they probably still have them. Remember raffle boards where you, you, they have some cause, some good cause, and they would sell raffle tickets uh, for like $5 in the pot, whoever would put a a name or a number, and whoever won it would get a shotgun or something. Well, I bought one of those raffle tickets. It was for a good cause, and I was all happy about that. And I get back to work, and all of a sudden I feel dirty. And the Lord began to talk to me, what's going on? And I thought, that's gambling. So I couldn't wait for the next break, lunch break, so I rounded up the fellow that was selling the raffle tickets and said, hey, hey, I want to give you my ticket back. I said, you keep the money for the cause, that's fine, but I want the ticket to go back. Why? Because that's gambling. And I think it's wrong to gamble. I didn't order at that time, but the Lord told me it was wrong. You see, my testimony as a child of God meant something to me. I didn't want to hurt the church. I didn't want to hurt the name of God. I didn't want to hurt any reproach come upon the name of Jesus Christ because the name of Jesus is powerful if we name it. And there's an awesome responsibility that goes with it. Uh, the, 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 the proverb said, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. There's a man of God in the city. He's an honorable man 
And all that he says shall surely come to pass. Wouldn't it be great if we lived a life in such a way that people in our neighborhood knew that what we said, our word was our bond? Wouldn't it be great if we lived our life in such a way like it used to? Remember years ago, you could shake a hand, you had a deal. Well, Lord, nowadays they want your social security number and your ID number and your underwear size. They want it all. They want it all. And then you're not going to get it sometimes. They know us to be honorable people. And they know that everything we say will come to pass. Now remember the situation that brings us to this part of the story. Kish had lost some animals. uh, Donkeys had run away. Kish gets his son Saul and and the servants say, go find my donkeys. So they lay out on the donkeys. They go, they go, they look, they look. They can't find anything. And finally Saul says, you know, we spent a lot of time doing this. Let's just go back home empty handed. Dad will understand. And the servant said, no, we're close to a city where there's a man of God. Let us go to that man of God. He's an honorable man. Maybe he can show us what to do. I don't know about you, but I like that. Amen. That's a wise decision. We've exhausted everything that we thought about doing, trying to do it all on our own. Now let's turn to God. And that what we do sometimes, even as Christians, we try to get the work done in our way, our strength, our wisdom, our ingenuity, and it boils down. Why don't we just give up and give it to God to begin with? I wonder sometimes why in the world they didn't go to Samuel to begin with. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to exhaust it and exhaust it and wear ourselves out. And finally, let's just go see what God says. Had he given God the first place, he could have saved themselves a lot of stress and saved themselves a lot of anxiety. Saul agrees with the servant. They go to the city. They find the man of God. In this case, it was the prophet Samuel. Now listen. The previous day, Samuel heard the Lord speak to him and say, in verse 16, Tomorrow... A man's come, going to come, uh, the one I've chosen to be the captain of the king of the nation. And Saul came to the city, looking at the prophet, and Samuel saw him, and the Lord spoke these words. Behold, the man whom I spoke to you about, this man shall rule over my people. Verse 17. Saul walks right up to Samuel and says, Do you know where the man of God lives? And Samuel says, I'm the man you're looking for. Today you'll eat with me, and tomorrow I'm going to tell you what you want to know. The donkeys you're looking for are found, but don't worry about the donkeys. You've got a bigger purpose in life. God has a bigger plan for your life. God has a bigger destiny for you to feel. God has a bigger pair of shoes for you to have. But you're out chasing donkeys. Let it sink in. God has a phenomenal plan, but you're out chasing donkeys. Too many Christians are chasing the things of life instead of dedicating themselves to the service of the Lord. Uh, Chasing after their dreams, chasing after their selfish desires, uh, chasing after the things of the world, chasing after the cares of this world. No regard for the purpose of God, no regard for the plan of God, no regard for the will of God. Chasing donkeys, but God has a better plan. God has a better purpose. God has something he wants you to do. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, be it male or be it female. Don't give up on the work of God in your life. He has something uh, for you uh, to do today. Set aside the donkey chasing and wait upon God. Samuel said, don't worry about the donkeys. They've been found. They've been taken care of. And he tells Saul, go with me to the high place. The high place is a place of worship. The high place is a place of prayer. The high place is the place uh, where you go to meet Almighty God. Friends, not to be ugly, but too many churches and too many Christians and preachers are not preaching God's word anymore and not teaching the Word of God anymore. It's things that tickle the ear and a message of feel good. We talk more about politics behind the pulpit. We talk more about sports figures behind the pulpit. We talk more about current events behind the pulpit. And we've got congregations of people that don't know the voice of God and don't know God in, in, in reality. And therefore, how can they be the man of God in the city or the man of God in the neighborhood? I'm reluctant to say what I'm about to say for fear you'll take it wrong. But the missionary family left this morning and the first thing he said to me is we travel a lot. 
And he said, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't get this kind of preaching everywhere you go. I said, what do you mean? And I, he told me what he meant. And so I want to be pre true to the word of God. God's word is relevant for today. And the needs in your community are many. And the needs in my community are many. And the needs in my neighborhood are many. And there are lost people in yours as well. Yeah. And it's not enough, church, for me to sit on my property behind my fence when I know people in my neighborhood that are lost. Now, we've never can do. You'll have some people in your neighborhood that won't like you. They won't, lo they won't like the Christ in you. They won't like the stance that you're taking for the Lord. But let me tell you, I've got a, a, a few neighbors that we're reaching out to, been reaching out to and befriended some and making friends with new ones. But I've got one particular family in my neighborhood. The wife is dying with cancer and the husband is so bitter, so angry, lashes out. Good man, I like him. We, we get along fine. But I feel so sorry for him. And it would be so easy to say, I don't want to get hurt. I don't, I'm afraid he'll say something bad to me. But no, I've got, more, I've got to get more involved in his life. He may reject me. That's part of it. But do I love him enough to tell him, I've got an answer to your problem. I've got an answer to your hurt. I don't know what God will do with your wife. The main thing is she ready to meet the Lord. Are you ready to meet the Lord? We, we, we major so many, many times in minors. And sometimes when we're rejected, and sometimes when people try to hurt us, we want to react and stay away from them. Remember to tell you, friend, we don't cast our pearl before the swine, but we've got to stand between them and hell. We've got to stand between them and destruction. We've got to stand between them and death. And if we're not that honorable man and woman of God, if we don't know the voice of God, how can we help other people? And I believe it's imperative, brothers and sisters, that we know our God and know where we, we know where we've been and we know where we are and we know who's brought us here. And we can offer the same thing to them. A man of God will love the book called the Bible and he'll speak from the pages and what he speaks, I believe, will come to pass. We need the touch of God upon our lives again, brothers and sisters. We need to love Jesus and we need to love his word once again. Listen to his voice and let him give us a message for our neighborhood. It may not be the same word for the neighbor on the right as it is the one on the left. But are you the only Christian in your neighborhood? Or are you the only Christian that really lets Christ live through you in your neighborhood? A lot of people go to church on Sunday. But live like the devil Monday through Saturday. Be the honorable man. Be the honorable woman. Learn his voice. Live out his message. Many people live out loud on Facebook. It's time the church live out loud outside the church house. A man of God in this city, he's an honorable man. All that he says come to pass. Let us go to him. Maybe he'll show us the way. While many are turning to palm readers and fortune tellers and horoscopes and Ouija boards and tea leaves for their direction, there's a better way. It's God's way. And they'll never know God's way until we get in their way. Roadblock. Bridge is out. Hell's waiting. Destruction's out here. You may not like this, but I'm holding you up. Why? Save somebody's life. You ever travel down a road and you're making good speed, and all of a sudden on that interstate it comes to a crashing halt? I mean, just from 70 to zero, boom. And you. And then you. You know, the, you know what I'm talking about? You feel like you can walk there quicker? On to get up and find out, thank God, somebody held up the traffic. Because had I barreled through at 70 miles an hour, I probably would be dead because of what's in landing in the road. By the same token, we've got to stand between them and destruction. And they might cuss us and fud us for holding them up. But I believe it will be faithful to say, look, man, I love you too much to at least not give you a witness of who Jesus is. You watched my life. You've seen who I am. You know what God's done in me. I simply want to offer to you. And if he don't want it, she don't want it. I, God's not called us to make him believe. God's called us to share the story so they can believe. Are you following what I'm saying? Someone in your neighborhood's on rock bottom. He or she may be contemplating taking their life. 
prior to doing that, will the person think of you? Will that person think of me? And when they remember our walk with God and say, Behold, there's a man or a woman of God in the neighborhood, a man who's held in high honor. All that he says comes to pass, so let's go there right now. Maybe he or she can tell us the way to go. If we just see one person in our neighborhood come to the Lord, will it not be worth it all? I think it will. Father, we pray for our neighborhoods this morning. We pray for our co-workers on the job, in the cubicle, wherever we work. We pray for our unsafe friends that we go to school with. We rub elbows with them every day. Lord, do we live lives that are different because you made the difference in us? Do we blend in with their jokes? Do we blend in with their lifestyle? You know, Lord, the thing that scares me some ways, not to be ugly, but American churches have not been persecuted, and could it be that we've not done anything worthy of such persecution? The world does not persecute religious people. It persecutes righteous people. Are we that holy, righteous person today? Are we that holy, righteous people today? God, if we're not, if we're, if we're deceiving ourselves by going through motions, and if we're deceiving ourselves, Lord, by being religious, then what good is it, God? Why, why settle for something pseudo when you promised us the reality of the real McCoy? God, I don't know where we are in life. I know we all struggle with stuff and things. I know we're pulled in a thousand different directions every day. We want to do right, and sometimes we fall short, and we're condemned by the devil, and we beat ourselves up, and we think, God, how can I be a light to my neighbor if I'm hardly keeping my head afloat myself? May we just take a deep breath this morning, God, and square this thing up today and say, God, not a one of us in this room was asked to be born, but we're here, our parents, and you made that choice. And some of us, God, we lived on one side of the track and some lived on the other and some, Lord, were born with a golden spoon in their mouth and some didn't even have a spoon to eat with. Some of our faces are black and some of our faces are white and some of our faces are red and some of our faces are brown. Some of us are fatter than others and some are skinny. Some are taller and some are shorter and some are prettier and some, well, look at me. But we're fearfully and wonderfully made and we don't have to let our backgrounds choose what we are today. Calvary made a difference. We do have a choice as to what we're going to do with Jesus. And since you've knocked on the door of our heart, we've accepted you. And that means we're somebody today. We may not look any different. We may not live a place any better. We may not have any more money. Our color of our skin not going to change. But God, the attitude inside that skin has. And I ask this morning that we will be men and women of integrity. That we will walk as a child of God should walk in a dirty world. That we will be men and women that people say, you know what? They've been with Jesus. Not just been to church. They've been with Jesus. They act different. They respond to pain different. They respond to death different. They respond to the pink slip different. They respond to the doctor's report much different than we did. What do they have? How could they smile with what they've gone through? Are they nuts? No. We're hooked up to the right bolt. You, Jesus. And I pray that we will settle once and for all that we're king's kids. If there's any sin in our life, God, forgive us of it right here, right now. And Lord, give us the grace to turn our head against it and walk away from it. That our life will not bring shame and disdain upon the person of Jesus Christ. And that our lives, Lord, that we live for ourselves to fulfill our own lusts and our own desires will not hinder the testimony of the church. We can be a godly person in our neighborhood and people will point out all the flaws that so-and-so did and all the fornication, all the adultery, all the homosexuality, all the scandal. It's out there for the world to see. But God, they need to see the true, blue, genuine, blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God that's living for you. May we be that neighbor. May we be that neighbor. Not trying to put on a facade but yielding to you, knowing your voice, and be willing to obey. 
Now, Lord, if we love you and keep your commandments, you will manifest yourself to us. So may we get rid of that right here and now. We belong to you. And God, if there's sin, may we confess it right here, right now, and put it under the blood. Now, teach us to live a life in the light of your coming eternity. Let our neighbors see Jesus in us. May our neighbors take knowledge that we have been with the Almighty God. They're fruit inspectors today, Lord. In the past, they've seen so much spoiled, rotten fruit. But God, may they see that we are the great fruit because we are hooked up to the vine, Jesus Christ. May our strength, our stamina, our anointing, our joy, our peace, everything that helps us to live godly in Christ Jesus, may it be drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I now pray for our neighbors. The ones to the left, the right, the ones in front and behind, the one on our city block, whomever we call our neighbor today, Lord, both living and working, may we not lock ourselves up in our doors, but may we get out. And may we learn our neighborhood, learn our city, learn our town, and may we put boots on the ground with a powerful message that will set them free. God, we cannot make them drink the water, but we can take the living water to them. And I pray as we do, you will convict them of their sin and save them for the glory of God. How are we remembered in our neighborhood today as a neighbor? How do they look upon us? Are we a troublemaker? Are we a peacemaker? God, it's not enough to live in a neighborhood. I want the neighborhood to become a brotherhood this morning. Bring us together through the blood of Jesus. So be it, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, there's one here today say, Pastor, I do not know the Lord as my personal Savior. Would you pray for me? Or you profess to be a Christian, but you know that you know you're struggling with sin. You know that you know that you're wrestling in areas that God does not want you to be wrestling with. You've been convicted many, many times. But right here, right now, you say, Pastor, by His grace, I'm putting it in the blood. Would you lift your hand up and right back down? I want to pray for you.